Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on the five fundamentals of RF you must know for wireless LAN success. My name is Tom Carpenter and I'm the CTO here at CWNP. Before we get started into the content today, let me make sure that you can hear me. If you could just either chat in or in the Q&A panel, just let me know that you're able to hear me. That'll be great and we'll continue on with the presentation. Excellent. Thank you for that feedback. So we're going to go ahead and get started today with this topic, which is a foundations topic. And it is really targeted at two groups of people. Those are the people studying for CWTS and or CWNA. However, these foundational concepts are absolutely essential to implementing an effective wireless LAN. If we don't know how RF works, we can't make RF work the way we want it to. And so it's very important to understand these foundations. Therefore, even if you've been around Wi-Fi for a while, I'm sure you'll hear some tips and tricks that will help you better optimize your networks as well. Now, before we get into the technical content of today's presentation, I do want to remind you that, of course, CWNP is all about certifying your knowledge and capabilities in relation to wireless networking. This means that we provide different certifications focused on different specialty areas of wireless networking. Of course, we have the CWNA, the Certified Wireless Network Administrator, which is the foundation of all of our other professional level certifications and even our expert level certification. Here you're going to learn about the basics of RF, which is partly what we're talking about today. You'll learn about wireless LAN hardware and the basics of planning and implementing a wireless network. And then at the professional level, there are three certifications, the security professional, the design professional, and the analysis professional. And these focus on three very important key areas of wireless LANs. First of all, of course, security, making sure that our network is secure and only those who should have access do have access and that all of the data is protected from eavesdropping and other attacks. And then, of course, design is about planning and implementing an effective wireless LAN that meets your needs. Key component there is meeting your needs. And that's why one big part of CWDP is needs analysis. And then, of course, the analysis professional is focused on looking at an existing wireless LAN and finding out how to make it perform better, how to resolve different problems that might be happening in the wireless LAN and so forth. So it's really a troubleshooting masterclass. And then once you have your CWNA, CWSP, CWDP, and CWAP, if you choose, you can apply for the Certified Wireless Network Expert. The four before it all have an exam associated. So you have to pass an exam to gain the certifications. With the CWNE, instead of passing an exam, you submit an application to the Board of Advisors, which is six different CWNEs that are going to look at the application, evaluate it, and determine your qualification to become a certified wireless network expert. It requires three years of enterprise experience and having passed all four of the other exams mentioned here on the screen. So it is an elite certification that nearly a couple hundred people now have, and it's certainly one well worth pursuing. Additionally, before we get into the specific topics of today, I want to remind you about our Wi-Fi Trek conferences coming up in the next few months. First of all, we'll be in Prague on June the 8th through the 10th at the Radisson Blue Alcorn Hotel. Very nice location there, and we'll be excited to see those of you who can attend that event. And then we'll be in New Orleans later in the year, September 28th through the 30th at the Hilton Riverside. And you can, of course, uh, find more information at the website at cwnp.com to go directly to the Prague registration page. Go to cwnp.com slash 2016 conference slash Prague. Okay, so let's talk about our agenda for today and what we'll be talking about. First of all, we're going to be looking at RF basics. So before we get into the five RF fundamentals, I do want to review some basics with you to make sure you have the terminology down. Then we'll get into the five RF fundamentals, which are channels, behaviors, measurements, interference, and analysis. And we'll look at those one by one. Our webinar will run until about 1.30 Eastern Standard Time. And so we try to keep them to about a half hour to not take too much time out of your day and yet provide you this valuable technical information. So first of all, RF basics. What we need to understand is frequencies, waves, and radios. The frequencies are the specific locations within the RF spectrum that we actually use to transmit our data or to pass signals on. The waves, of course, are the actual medium that we manipulate in order to modulate data and therefore transmit data. And then the radios do the transmission. So let's talk about this a little bit more. First of all, when we look at frequencies, the two primary frequency bands that we use for 802.11 wireless networks 
are the 2.4 gigahertz frequency band and the 5 gigahertz frequency band. Now, 2.4 gigahertz many years ago kind of won a battle because of being first to market. That is with the original 802.11 standard that came out in 1997, sometimes called 802.11 prime, did not specify any operations in 5 gigahertz. It only specified operations in 2.4 gigahertz. And since that was first, these were the devices that existed. We then had a rolling effect that has stuck with us to this very day. And that is that because 2.4 gigahertz client devices already existed, even when APs came out that could support both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, we still kept supporting 2.4 gigahertz because 2.4 gigahertz clients existed. And so therefore, we still find ourselves in that space today, which is not a good space to be in. 2.4 gigahertz is very cluttered. Some have said in recent months that 2.4 gigahertz is dead. This is, of course, completely untrue. How can you say that something that is alive and utilized more than anything else is dead? It's not dead, but it's certainly crippled. It's crippled because of the fact that so many devices operate there, not just our wireless networking devices, but many other devices as well. So 2.4 gigahertz is not an effective band for enterprise wireless LANs when we have control over the client devices that are going to be used. If we can dictate that 5 gigahertz clients will be used, then we want to use 5 gigahertz clients. Why? Well, we'll see later. There are many more channels in 5 gigahertz because we have much more frequency space. So the first thing to realize is that the frequencies matter. And the frequency is really just how often RF wave cycles per second. So how many waves per second are we creating? 20 hertz would be 20 cycles. 900 megahertz would be 900 million cycles. 2.4 gigahertz is 2.4 billion cycles per second. So higher frequency waves have shorter wavelengths and lower frequency waves have longer wavelengths. Now the other factor is the wave itself. So the wavelength is an entire 360 degree movement of an RF wave. This is one hertz. And waves have characteristics that are important, like the amplitude of the wave. This is the strength or power of the wave. How strong is it? And the strength or power of the wave attenuates or weakens as it travels through free space and as it passes through materials like walls and doors and floors. The period is the distance between two identical points on an RF wave. And a phase is really not a feature of a wave, but it is the characteristic when two waves are compared with one another. That is, two waves can be in phase or they can be some degree out of phase. When two waves are in phase, if they are the same wave, they strengthen the signal received. When two waves are 180 degrees out of phase, they can completely cancel the signals, but certainly out of phase waves arriving at a receiver cause a weakening of the signal. Now, how can you have multiple phases of the same signal? Well, you do that because of the RF behaviors we'll talk about later. The reflection that causes the signal to move around within a space so that you get multiple copies of the signal at the receiver at slightly different times, which means they're slightly out of phase or possibly completely out of phase. This is an important thing to consider, and it's one thing that we actually take advantage of in our modern wireless LANs with 802.11n and 802.11ac using what is called MIMO, multiple input, multiple output. We're actually taking advantage of these phase variations and using it to transmit multiple spatial streams. Now, the last thing I mentioned for RF basics is the radios. So the radios are the transmitters and receivers of RF signals. The antenna is not actually the transmitter. The antenna is the radiator. The antenna simply allows the electromagnetic waves to go out of it into free space and propagate. But it's not the actual transmitter. The transmitter, you could say, is the entire radio chain, the combination of the radio, any cables or connectors, the antenna, all of it together become a transmitter. It's also called an intentional radiator. Now, many devices have multiple radio chains. So when you see three by three by three, that means there are three radio chains and we can send out three spatial streams. And this is an important thing to consider when you're implementing modern wireless LANs. So now let's begin talking about the five RF fundamentals or the five fundamentals of RF that you have to know for wireless LAN success. The first one is channels. And we have different channels depending on whether we're in 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. 
And we're about to see why I said that five gigahertz is so much better for implementing wireless LANs. In 2.4 gigahertz, you have a total of 14 channels. However, these 14 channels are spaced only five megahertz apart based on their center frequency. So you'll notice in the screen that channel one centers on 2.412 gigahertz and channel two centers on 2.417 gigahertz. So notice they're only five megahertz apart. However, the channels are 20 megahertz wide for OFDM, which would be 802.11b, or rather, I'm sorry, 802.11g and 802.11a in five gigahertz, but we're focused on 2.4 gigahertz here, and also 802.11n. So 802.11n and 802.11g use OFDM and they use 20 megahertz channels. 802.11b and the original 802.11 use 22 megahertz channels. So the point is that because the channels are 20 or 22 megahertz wide, when we actually transmit and they're centered on a center frequency, and these numbered channels are only five megahertz apart, that tells you that using channel one, the actual signal itself is going to span channels one, two, and three, and then the sidebands, the extra energy that is just radiated as we generate a signal, is going to go even up to four and possibly five, depending on the output power. This is why we say in 2.4 gigahertz, when you only have 11 channels, which is all we have in the US and in many other regions of the world, you only have three real channels that you can use. Even though there are 11, we can only use three of them, channel one, channel six, and channel 11. This is why hopefully in your enterprise wireless LAN on 2.4 gigahertz, when you do a scan of the environment, you see a lot of APs on channels one, channel six, and channel 11. Hopefully you don't see any APs on channels two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Sadly, in mixed environments, particularly in shared spaces, like office spaces and things like that, where multiple companies are represented, you see nearly all of these channels utilized. And this causes a lot of what we call adjacent channel interference. The channels are stepping on each other because their signals invade the other channel bandwidth. So 2.4 gigahertz, here's why it is so cluttered. We really only have three channels and then add on to that all of the many, many, many devices that are actually there operating in 2.4 gigahertz. Now, when we get to five gigahertz, things are much improved. In five gigahertz, we have 20 megahertz OFDM channels. We have other channel widths as well. So you can bond to 20 megahertz channels for a 40 megahertz 802.11n or AC channel. You can also have 80 megahertz 802.11ac channels and 160 megahertz 802.11ac channels. Now, I don't recommend using 160 megahertz channels, even if they're available and when they're available uh, in any enterprise deployment ever. 80 megahertz channels are still up for debate in some enterprise deployments based on the, the fact that it has some dynamic channel capabilities built into 802.11ac so that it can only use a 40 megahertz channel if that's all that's clear or a 20 megahertz channel if that's all that's clear or it can burst at the entire 80 megahertz channel if it's all clear. So there are some capabilities there, but because we haven't really been implementing it, we don't really see the efficiency gains that it might bring us yet in any practical real world implementation. So at this time, we're still generally recommending 20 and 40 megahertz channels, 40 megahertz channels for standard data networks that are medium to low density. When you get into high density and certainly very high density, we want to stick with 20 megahertz channels. Now, we don't really have the depth of time to get into all of the details about channel selection today, but just note that many of the five gigahertz channels are what we call DFS channels, dynamic frequency selection. And what that means is the channels may have to monitor for radar. And if they detect radar activity, they have to move off channel. And so DFS channels, if they can be used, should be used, but you have to make sure you understand your environment and you also have to understand your clients. If the vast majority of your clients do not support the DFS channels, then there's not a whole lot of reason to take advantage of them. But you can always be sure that 3640, 4448, 149, 153, 157, and 161 are pretty much available everywhere. So even if nothing else, we automatically know we have eight channels. Nearly all clients will support those. And most clients will also support channels 52 through 64. And some clients will support some of the channels from 100 to 140. Now 144 is actually a channel just introduced in 802.11ac. So we don't see full support for it out there yet. 
And just as a note, channel 165, we used to refer to that as the ISM band channel in the US, but it's been integrated to Uni3 now. It really doesn't matter. On all of our exams today, you are no longer tested on terms like Uni1, Uni2, Uni2E, Uni3, or ISM, because those are US specific and our exams are global. So instead, you're just tested on your awareness of the frequencies and the channels that are used and are available. Now the next thing that is one of the five fundamentals of RF you must know is RF behavior. RF, as it moves through a space, has a particular behavior set. And, and these behavior sets include scattering, diffraction, reflection, refraction, and absorption. Now we don't have to get too fancy in a, into all the technicalities of it today. You just need to understand these basics. And the most important ones we see indoors are ref reflection and absorption with some refraction and diffraction as well, but mostly reflection and absorption is what we think about. So reflection is the RF signal reflecting or bouncing off of some kind of reflective material that has a size greater than the wavelength. And so we're talking here about metal objects like filing cabinets, things like that. These can all cause reflection and many other objects cause some level of reflection. It's reflectivity factor may be higher or lower, but some level of reflection occurs. Absorption is when, technically speaking, the RF energy is converted to heat. And so what happens is the RF energy converts to heat as it is absorbed and therefore it is lost. This is why your microwave oven works, okay? You close the door, you start it up, and all of a sudden 2.4 gigahertz radio waves are blasted into the microwave oven. These radio waves are absorbed very well by water, and so the absorption is the converting of the electromagnetic waves into heat. And the end result is that your liquid heats up or anything that has moisture in it that's in the microwave. Think about it like this. Have you ever noticed that you can take a glass of water, sit it outside, and if the light waves pass through the glass, it will actually heat up the water more than just contacting water directly? Well, this is in part because of absorption and refraction behaviors. Now, refraction is where the RF wave bends as it moves through a material. So it's going to change slightly. And the example I like to use with this is take a clear glass, put some water in it, and take a butter knife, place it in the glass, and look at it from the side. It will appear to you that the knife breaks in two at the point of the water. And so you'll see the part of the knife that is in the water appears to be at a different location than where it really entered the water. There's this kind of illusion that occurs. That's because the light waves are refracting as they pass through the water. And so refraction can also occur slightly changing the path of an RF wave and of course some absorption as well. Diffraction is how an RF wave may move around a large object and sometimes change direction. And then scattering is when an RF wave hits something a little different than reflection that is smaller than the wave and breaks it up and sends it in multiple directions. It's really many, many reflections of the RF wave. So why are these behaviors important? Well, they're the reason that when you put an AP in a room in a building, those radio frequency waves can get to nearly every place in the room and also other rooms because they're reflecting around as they move throughout the space. And of course, they're passing through some materials as well. Now, the interesting thing is that this can be bad for old type of networks like 11BG and 11A, but it can be very good for new networks like 11N and 11AC because these multiple signals give us this reflectivity that allows us to have multiple spatial streams, separation of data based on phases and other factors. So RF behaviors, key to understand. The next of the five fundamentals of RF you must know, the third is RF measurements. So we need to know how we look at an RF signal, measure it, and understand how strong it is. Now we can measure RF signals in absolute and relative units. We'll talk about absolute first. Milliwatt is a common measurement. A milliwatt is one one thousandth of a watt. So if we say we have a one thousand milliwatt signal, then that means we have a one watt signal, okay? Usually we're looking at milliwatts in indoor wireless lands at a range somewhere between 5 and 50 milliwatts of output power. So these are the actual 
uh, power levels in milliwatts. Now, the issue is that we don't use really very high output power levels, but we do use very low output power levels, or at least very low received power levels. And because of that, it's good to have another absolute measurement, and that is what we call DBM, decibels to milliwatts. Now, a decibel itself is a relative measurement, a dB, that's a relative measurement, but dBm is an absolute measurement because it's a decibel relative to milliwatt. That is, zero dBm equals one milliwatt. So when we talk about negative dBm values, we're not talking about something like we have negative power. We have less than some power. No, we're not saying we have less than some power. We're saying we have a certain amount less than one milliwatt. We always have something positive. So our power received at the antenna is always positive, but it's somewhere between zero and one milliwatt. Well, that range can go to many, many decibel places. So rather than saying 0 0.000000000037 000 000 000 milliwatts, we would instead use a dBm value. So for example, notice that when we look at negative 40 dBm, we're talking about 100 nanowatts. So obviously, we don't want to have to do all of the decimal places to get to that point. So you'll see these dBm values in tools. When you look at RF signal strength, it'll tell you the power level in dBm in many cases. And the reason it's doing that is to avoid having to put some field of dot zero 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 and who knows who would understand it anyway. So it makes it more human friendly when we're dealing with power levels. Now, we also have relative power levels, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but first, some terms, RF measurements. We have this term called RSSI. It stands for Received Signal Strength Indicator, and it can be a bit complex because technically, according to the 802.11 standard, it's a value that different vendors end up specifying differently. And many tools today don't even say RSSR, RSSI, they'll just say signal strength or something like that. Uh, and oftentimes they're reporting it in DBM instead of reporting it as some arbitrary value. So RSSI has kind of evolved over time and today people will use the term in direct exchange for DBM. But technically according to the standard, RSSI is not equal to DBM and DBM is not equal to RSSI. But you'll see them used interchangeably a lot when people are talking about signal strength. Probably the better term to use is more generic signal strength rather than saying RSSI if you're going to equate it to DBM directly. Or you need some way to map what an RSSI is to a DBM. So sometimes the common vernacular can get a bit confusing out there, but for now just know that RSSI is a factor of your signal strength and signal strength is often reported in DBM these days. The noise floor is just the signal strength of the RF noise in the frequency space that you're using uh, within that environment. Usually we're looking at somewhere between neg 93 to neg 103 or 104 dBm. And that would be your noise floor. The difference between the received signal strength and the noise floor is what we call SNR, and we represent it in decibels, dB. So if the noise floor, for example, is neg 95 dBm, and the signal strength is neg 70 dBm, then that means your SNR is 25 dB, not dBm. It's 25 dB. There's 25 decibels difference between the signal and the noise floor, okay? So we wanna use the right term, dBm, the signal strength, DBM, the noise floor, but SNR is just DB, okay? So this is a relative value because it's the difference between two absolute values. So it's going to change depending on what the two absolute values are. Now we also have a little chart here for you. One milliwatt equals zero DBM, 10 milliwatt equals 10 DBM, 100 milliwatt equals 20 DBM, and one water 1000 milliwatts equals 30 DBM. These can be some good starting points to memorize because many times when you're doing RF math calculations, you can go ahead and jump to a number you already know and then go from there. So for example, if you already know that 20 dBm is 100 milliwatts and you're trying to figure out, well, then what would 23 dBm be? Well, if you already know what 20 dBm is, you don't have to start with zero dBm is one milliwatt because normally if you're gonna to try to figure out what is 23 dBm, you could use the 
rules of tens and threes that I'm going to talk about momentarily and calculate it. But you'd first have to do 10, then another 10, then a three. But if you already know 20 dBm is 100 milliwatts, then all you have to do is add three dB and that's going to double it. So it'd be 200 milliwatts. Let me talk to you about that here in the screen. Notice where it says gain and loss examples. When we're talking about the rules of tens and threes, what we mean is that if you add three dB of power, you double the power. If you subtract 3 dB of power, you half the power. So this is the three rule. So if I have 50 milliwatts and I add 3 dB of gain, I now have 100 milliwatts. But if I have 50 milliwatts and I lose 3 dB or I have 3 dB of loss, now I have 25 milliwatts, okay? So the three rule, add three, multiply by two, subtract three, divide by two. Then there's the 10 rule. If you add 10 dB of power, the signal strength is 10 times stronger. If you subtract 10 dB, the signal strength is 1 tenth or 10%. So let's go back to our 50 example. 50 milliwatts plus 10 dB is 500 milliwatts. 50 milliwatts minus 10 dB is 5 milliwatts. Okay? So these rules of tens and threes can be used to calculate your power levels. And we're not going to get into complex examples today, but I want to make sure that that's introduced and understood here. So again, going back to our example of, I need to know what 23 dBm really is in milliwatts. If I already know 20 dBm is 100 milliwatts, then all I have to do is add 3 dB, right? And when I add 3 dB, what do I do? I double it. Therefore, what we have is that our 100 milliwatts becomes 200 milliwatts. Now the fourth RF fundamental or of the five fundamentals you need to know for wireless line success is that interference is real. Um, RF interference occurs when an external modulated or unmodulated influence affects the ability of an RF receiver to interpret a data signal. This is important because higher data rates use more complex waveforms. And because they're more complex, it's more susceptible to error. So we see here on the screen uh, an example of a constellation chart. It's called for 64 QAM, and that's quadrature amplitude modulation. Now, this is not even the highest data rate modulation. We have 256 QAM now in 802.11 AC, and we're going to go higher in the future. So the point is that the higher modulation data rates use more complex waveforms and the result is we need a very good signal then to be able to process that waveform. And that's why RF interference can become a key factor in getting good data rates. Low signal strength and external RF interference sources are problematic. Now, it's important to know RF interference happens at the receiver. It doesn't happen at the transmitter or in between the transmitter and the receiver. That is to say, if I'm sending a signal on channel one in 2.4 gigahertz, to a receiver that's 200 meters away. And in the middle, there's another network on 2.4 gigahertz, but it has very weak signal strength. That network is not going to interfere with my signal. It's going to go right on ahead and pass through. So the point is that interference happens at the receiver and that's where you need to look for it. Now, low duty cycle interference can often be tolerated. Low duty cycle interference means the interference is not existing, say, 40, 50, 60, 70% of the time on the medium. It just comes up maybe five to 20% of the time. In these cases, you may still be able to communicate, but you're gonna find your retry rate will probably go up for your 802.11 devices. High duty cycle interference can wreak havoc on a channel. There are some devices out there that have a near 100% duty cycle, particularly some of the 802.11 channel video devices. They're not really 802.11, but they use the 802.11 channels and they can have very high utilization. We're seeing several of these now come in the five gigahertz range as well. So it's important to understand interference. And then the fifth of the five fundamentals of RF you must know for wireless line success is analysis. So all this other stuff we've talked about, channels, RF interference, RF measurements, all of these things we need to understand how do we look at it? How do we analyze it and see what's going on in our environment? Well, the answer to that at the pure RF level is something called spectrum analysis. With spectrum analysis or a spectrum analyzer, we can actually capture the RF energy and represent it in a lot of different ways. 
On the screen here, you can see the MetaGeek Channelizer and the YSpy DBX adapter that's used with it. And you can see Air Magnet Spectrum Expert and the Spectrum adapter that's used with that. These are two very popular tools today because they're still updated and maintained and you can still buy the devices to do the spectrum analysis. And they operate, of course, in 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. So what they'll do is they'll show you the frequencies in fast Fourier transform mode, which is where uh, I like to say it like this. Think of it as if the waveform is coming right at you and you're looking at the individual frequencies and what's being modulated on them. And then you can also see uh, things like swept spectrogram and these types of views that are going to show you the RF energy over time in visual representations, usually using color to represent the strength of the signal. So if you're having what you think might be interference problems because of high retry rates or something like that, a spectrum analyzer will show you devices that are not 802.11, whereas a protocol analyzer is only going to show you 802.11 frames. With a spectrum analyzer, you can see video devices, you can see cameras, you can see phones, you can see microwave oven interference, you can see motor interference, anything like this that might be radiated in the environment. And you can also use them to move around until you find the signal is at its strongest to find the area where the actual radiator exists. So RF analysis is key. Of course, we talk about it in CWNA, but it's a key factor in CWAP as well. Okay, so we're going to have some time here for any questions that you might have here at the end of the presentation. And if you do not have questions, let me just say to you, thank you for attending and uh, hope to see you on a future webinar or at one of our conferences coming up either in June or September.